You know, the, the thing about life is we all will experience tragedy and difficulty. And the question is, do you have someone there for you when that happens? And so I'm so thrilled that the Jonah Saints became a part of the family last week because otherwise we wouldn't have even known to be there and to support. And so I just encourage you, if you don't have a family, if you don't have a church family, when you're not from Pittsburgh, people not, everybody's not here doesn't have all of their people in town. And so when you have people who this is not their home, but they come and they get connected, it's important that we represent and that we be Christ's hands and feet. And even though, you think about the scriptures, even Jesus, and he was God's son and he knew who he was and who he was in his assignment. But even in his difficult moments, he gathered his disciples and he took them with him. And he needed prayer. He needed support and encouragement and love. So please support and encourage that family in the days ahead. Amen. So here at Bible Center, our men read the scriptures together as a sign of our submission to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And we're going through the New Testament together and we're reading and we're in the book of Revelation. And so this week's memory verse is Revelation chapter 11, verse 15. If the men, if you desire, ask that you would stand with us as we read the scripture. Uh, does anybody have it memorized? I'll let you go first. Revelation 11, chapter 15. <laughs> and a hush fell over the crowd. I'm going to be honest, <laughs> my mother and I were laughing. We're going through every, you know, things are going good. Reading through the Bible together, this is great. But Revelation, whew, I'm a little lost, I'll be honest. And I'm struggling, I'm, I'm reading. And so what, what we decided, <laughs> my mother said, well, you know, the Lord said, that, well, maybe this is John's letter, the Lord's letter to John, and maybe it ain't got nothing to do with me. You know what I mean? None of my business. Maybe I don't need to be eavesdropping on his letter. So it's going to require a little bit more work for us to get deep into Revelation, but Nonetheless, we can still read. And so uh, Revelation 11, chapter 15, the memory verse reads on thus wise, as they say in church. Let's read this together. The seventh angel sounded his trumpet and there were loud voices in heaven which said the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and his Messiah. And he will reign forever and ever. So I'm not completely sure what's going on in Revelation, but we know that Jesus wins. Amen. Amen. <laughs> And he will reign forever and ever. Amen. All right, fellas, y'all can sit down. One of the most important things we do here each week at Bible Center is we pray for our children. And so we would ask the children to join us in the middle aisle as we pray and prepare to release them to Children's Church. And I think Emil and Rachel are going to pray for the babies. So as they would come, and then the young folks can go to Children's Church. Whatever you want. Oh, you need your mic. Yes, sir. Maybe. Lord, we come before you today. Lord, we come before you today in the season of Advent. We just welcome these kids. Um, as we wait on you during this time, we just are reminded of you know, the four seasons of Advent. Of the hope, the joy, the peace, um, and the love that we feel from you and we're waiting for you. We're just reminded that these children in front of us today bring all those same qualities into our lives. And we just pray that you know, as we're waiting on you, that we can see and wait on the, the joy and the peace, the hope and the love that you're bringing to us through these kids. We pray that you know, in their lives they can become more like you, that they can become uh, followers in your name. In your name we pray. So we're on the cusp of a new year. And so has anyone started with your resolutions yet? Anybody got the resolutions, the plans? This is what I'm going to do? Nobody? <laughs> wow, we just, we just punt. We just gave up. We quit. Goodness gracious. Can, can we put that, put that slide up, please? So 2024 New Year's resolutions, right? And the areas tend to be the same, right? Health. I'm going to eat right. I'm going to exercise. I'm going to get my health together. Or then there's our mental health, right? So I'm going to uh, meditate more. I'm going to pursue therapy. I'm going to do something to get my mind right. My finances. Anybody have goals financially? I'm going to, anybody like, I'm going to get on a budget. 
right? I'm going to get out of debt. Uh, I'm going to increase my income, reduce my expenses. Then there's our personal development. I'm going to, I don't know, go back to school. I'm going to write a book. There's something I want to do for myself. Relationships. I'm going to spend time with my family. I'm going to uh, uh, call my, check on my kids who are out of town. I'm going to uh, develop some new relationships. There's some person at work or in my neighborhood who I want to build a relationship with, right? A career, another common area, you know, I'm going to get a promotion this year, or I'm going to find a new job this year, or I'm just not going to get fired this year, right? <laughs> Travel and adventure. Anybody got any place they want to go? You have some, some place in your mind where you want to go? Where you want to go? Back to Europe, okay. Somebody say Dubai? Greece, Greece? okay. Kennywood, yeah, that, I'm where I, all right, right? Place where people want to go. Organize, declutter. Anybody have that closet? Right, the drawer? We just we, we did a closet and a drawer. It's, it's so exciting to like know where stuff is, amen? And not keep, re anybody have to rebuy stuff because you have so many you just don't know where they are? All right, very good. It's not just me. And maybe there are other areas. So we're thinking about 2024. Often we, we, we have plans, we have desires, we have aspirations, we make resolutions. The question becomes, why are things so hard to change? Why is it so difficult to change? And what I want to argue today is the reason it's difficult to change is because we focus on the wrong things. And we'll talk about that in a few minutes. But let's go back to what we've been talking about for weeks, this idea of our core beliefs. One of the reasons it's so hard to change is because the beliefs that we have are inconsistent with the change that we want to make. And so, the belief, I'll say it again, the beliefs that we have are inconsistent with the changes that we want to make. And so we talked about this idea of our core beliefs. And they can be positive, they can be negative, but they're deep-seated. They're assumptions about ourselves, about God, and about other people. Often they develop when we're children, right? Our core beliefs, those things that we believe about ourselves, about the world, our worldview, they happen through the events, through the experiences, through the people who raise us. We have a set of core beliefs. And then they help shape our identity. And then as a result, they drive our thoughts, our feelings, and our actions. And so we, you're familiar with this, uh, this picture. We've been showing this for uh, a while. Something happens. It triggers our thoughts. We have an emotional response, and then we act. And more or less, that's what happens. So our core beliefs is at the center of that, and it shapes how we respond. You walked past me. You didn't look at me. If my beliefs were that I don't matter, I'm not important, and so forth, then you didn't look at me. I feel like, oh, you feel something funny about me. You don't like me. There's something wrong with me. I feel bad, and then I shy away from you. And so now we've created this distance between us solely based on my core beliefs, which then manifest in my thoughts, my feelings, and my actions. Interesting, right? And so the negative and common negative core beliefs that plague us as people is I'm worthless, I'm unattractive, I'm ugly, I'm unlovable, right? And a lot of people carry these beliefs and then they shape how they think, how they feel, how they act. And as a result, unfortunately, it causes people to respond to them in a way that's consistent with their beliefs. And so let's dig a little bit deeper this week. We want to talk about our identity. So we've talked about our core beliefs. Our identity is those core beliefs we have about ourselves. My self-image. How do I see myself? Do I see myself as useless? Do I see myself is dumb. Do I see myself as amazing? Do I see myself as wonderful? Do I see myself, do I see myself through the lens that my mama sees me? See what I'm saying? You see yourself like your mama, you, I, listen, Gary Nelson, through his mama's eyes, he's the most wonderful person on the planet. <laughs> now his wife may adjust it, dial that down a little bit, you know what I mean? But how do we see ourselves? And then our esteem. How do you value yourself? What is your worth? How do you look at yourself? And then your role, your identity. So some of us, if you have kids, you may see yourself as a parent. You may see yourself as an entrepreneur. You may see yourself as a, a teacher. You may see yourself through the lens of your job or whatever your roles are. And then finally, we have social identities, right? Our racial ethnic identity, our gender identity. How do we see ourselves socially, our social class? We identify with 
I'm poor or I'm affluent. Very few people say they're rich. Even rich people don't say they're rich, but I'm middle class, right? But the point is we have these core beliefs. So the sermon in a sentence this morning is when we allow Christ to change our identity, we can change our lives. When we allow Christ to change our identity, our self-concept, our understanding of who we are, we can change our lives. Let's pray. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we come giving you thanks. Lord God, I thank you for this time together. I thank you for the opportunity to share with my brothers and sisters, mothers and fathers, sons and daughters, to share what you've shared with me through your word. God, I ask that you open up our hearts and minds to be receptive. God, I ask that you would change someone's identity, their perception of themselves today. Lord God, as we look at the truth of your word, I pray for transformation in our thoughts, our feelings, our actions, our beliefs, and our understanding of who we are through you. And as a result, what we're able to do and who we're able to be as we seek to advance your kingdom and to destroy the work of our enemy and to see your kingdom come and your will done on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. And so today we're talking about new identity, new identity, new way of understanding who we are. And the core scripture this morning is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. And it says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, therefore, if anyone, 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 and doesn't matter who you are, doesn't matter where you've come from, doesn't matter your race, your ethnicity, doesn't matter whether you're poor, you're rich. It says, if anyone is in Christ, is in relationship with Christ, submitted to Christ as our Lord and our Savior and our King, Christ means King, anointed one, Messiah. If anyone is in Jesus Christ, he or she is a new creation. You are brand new. So our past, what people said about us, the things that we've done, it says when we are in Christ, when we surrender our life to him, those things are obliterated. And we are brand new. We are a new creation. The old what has passed away and see the new has come. Can we read this together, please? Therefore... If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, and see, the new has come. Say someone, I am new. I am new. I'm new. If you are in Christ, you are brand new. The challenge is to get us to believe it. That's the hard part. You see, the scriptures, if you believe that they are true, then we are brand new. When we are in Christ, Surrender our life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. We become his sons, his daughters, his children. Then we are brand new. The challenge is our identity. If we do not identify as bringing brand new, then our old habits, our own way of thinking, our old core beliefs will continue to dominate and drive our lives. And so when we allow Christ to change our identity, we can then change our lives. Let's keep reading. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 through 12. You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. You see, he's saying to you, I understand who you used to be. But because now you are in Christ, this is who I say you. You see, so it doesn't matter what your mom said, your dad said, to the extent that that wasn't helpful or even to the extent it was inaccurate. When we are in Christ Jesus, we turn to his word and we see what he says about us and who he says we are. We're chosen. We're special. We're royal. We're holy. Do you think about yourself in those terms? When you look in the mirror, what do you see? When you look in the mirror, what do you say? When you look, <laughs> chief, what do you, when you look in the mirror, whose voice do you hear? Is that how you see yourself? Somebody talk to me a little bit. <laughs> got, we got a Yaman from Nigeria, okay. How else do we, as somebody nodding and shaking your head, what, what, what do you see? What do you hear? What do you think? What pops into it? Come on. 
Not always, okay. Grateful, praise God. Depends on the day. Someone said they are fearfully and wonderfully made, right? I'm kind of in the depends on the day, right? But this is why we have to remind ourselves. Because, see, what we think is not necessarily true. You see, we can perceive, we can misunderstand things all the time. But we go to the word of God for truth. It says you're chosen. And that you may declare the praise of him who called you out of darkness. He says you were in darkness. You were dead. The, the, the scripture tells, I think it's Ephesians chapter 2. It says we were dead in our sins. And then that big giant word but comes and it erases everything before it. He says, God called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Not just people, but the people of God, his special possession. If you believe that there's a God and you believe that he's true, what does it mean for you to be his special possession? Let's keep reading. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles, because you are a special possession, to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives because of who you are, a royal priesthood, a possession of God. Live such good lives among the pagans, people who don't know God, that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day that he visits us. He said there should be such a difference in who we are when our mind changes, when our perception of who we are changes, when we understand who God says we are, it changes us. And as a result, we're able to live such good lives that evil people who falsely accuse us, it says they end up giving glory to God. We call that kingdom core beliefs. When we are saved, rescued, our core beliefs about who we are become what God says about us and who we are. He says that he loves us unconditionally. He says in his word, he will supply all of my needs according to his riches and glory. He says, I don't have to be anxious about anything. He agrees with Aaron that she is fearfully and wonderfully made. He says he will never leave us or forsake us. He says all of these things in his word about who we are. The challenge is we allow the enemy, we allow our family, we allow people in the street, we allow people, frankly, who should not really even matter to us. If you think about whose opinion should matter. You think about who you're going to compare yourself with and who you're going to listen to. Should it be God's opinion that shapes who we are? Or should it be the opinion of that person who's jealous of you? That person who wishes they had what you had. Maybe it's just the peace. That peace of mind that you have. That joy that you have. Do we allow those people to shape our identity or do we allow and listen to the voice of God to tell us who we are? And so in Christ, our king, we surrender our lives to him. And so when we think about becoming who he said we're going to be, even when we think about this idea of resolutions and why we can't change and why we find change difficult, there's three levels of change in our behavior. The first level, the inner level, is our identity, right? Our core concept. That should be who God says that we are. The next thing is our plan, our strategy, right? How we're going to get to and ultimately reach our goal. And so we always talk about smart goals and all that, right? So let me see. So the goal is I want to lose 20 pounds. The plan is, you know, I could cut off a limb. Not going to do that. So I'm going to eat less, I'll count my calories, and I'm going to exercise every day, right? That becomes the plan. And then finally, uh, the identity is I will become a person who's lean and healthy. The problem is, of course, I start with the goal. And what I want to argue is the key is to start with our identity. Who do we want to be? And then that will shape our plan we shape our outcomes. Who do you want to be? How do you envision yourself? How do you see yourself? And so the key truth, the key to our long-term change is found in our short-term or our daily routines. The key to your future 
It's found in your routine. I can predict pretty well how healthy we will be <clears throat> in the future based on what we do today. I can predict your financial situation in the future largely by what we do today. Right? If you go to the mall every day, or go online, people don't go to the mall anymore. You go online every day, and this is real simple. If you spend more than you have, <laughs> I can predict there's a, there's a condition. It's called broke. <laughs> right? I can predict with probably 100% accuracy that if you spend everything that you have <laughs> and more, fast forward, you will be broke. And so the idea is we think about our habits, and our habits are our routine or our practice that we do regularly, those things that we do automatically in response to a situation. If our habits are dysfunctional, we will have dysfunctional outcomes. Does that make sense? Amen. And so back to this idea of our identity, our core beliefs, our habits, if we can change our identity, it will change our habits. If we can adjust our thinking to be who God says we are, then that will change our plans, and then that will change the outcomes that we experience. So I want to argue that we should start with our identity. Start with who God says you are. Start with who he has designed you to be. And then work our way from the inside out. And when that change happens, our habits can change, and then we can experience the abundant life. Anybody familiar with the magic penny? Anybody seen the magic penny? We talked about that, the magic penny. So Magic Penny, hold on a sec, wait, 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 like that for one minute. Imagine I'm going to give you a million dollars today, or I'm going to give you a Magic Penny that every day it doubles. What you want? Be guaranteed a million dollars right now, right now. JV, it's a million dollars, girl. Right now, today, or the Magic Penny? <laughs> Who wants the million dollars? Let me see who wants to make it. Who wants a million dollars? She's like, I'll, I'll take the, the million today. She's like, I, tomorrow, they like, tomorrow is not promised to us. Come on now. <laughs> All right, let me see the penny. Who, 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 wants, who wants the penny? Who wants the million dollars? Okay, I got, it's a little mix, but we got a lot of folks who want the penny. Let's, let's watch the penny. Come on, go ahead. So the magic penny, we're going to do for 31 days. First day is worth one cent. Second day, two cents. Fast forward to day 10, it's only worth $5.12. Fast forward to day 10. Twenty-nine. It's worth two million six hundred eighty-four three hundred fifty-four dollars. Day thirty-one, ten million seven hundred thirty-seven four hundred eighteen dollars. Whoo! Let's say we wait till day two. Five million dollars. Let's say we wait to day ten. It's only worth twenty thousand. That's still a good deal. Only worth twenty thousand dollars. This, my friends, is known as the power of. Compound interest. Give me the next one. Anybody know this guy, Einstein? <laughs> he said, compound interest is the eighth wonder of the world. I thought I made that up, but I didn't. It's the eighth wonder of the world, right? And either you, it benefits you or it abuses you. You got a credit card? Look at your credit card. Look on the back. Now, they finally put the actual interest rate and what you'll pay if you pay the minimum payment. If you borrow $2,000 and you pay the $14.30 that they want you to pay, you will pay that off in 2090, <laughs> right? You will never pay it off because why? The nature of compound interest. If you give me, if I can get 20%, 25%, 22% from you, I'm rich. And that's how this, it's set up, right? It's definitely a system. So here's the thing. Our habits compound. Let me show you this graphic. Our habits compound. See, here's what happened. If I, I'm trying to lose weight, I'm trying to get in shape, I'll go to the gym three days in a row. I get on a scale. Scale hasn't budged. I'm like, never mind. I quit. Now, I didn't get where I am in three days, but I want instant results. Isn't that true? And so if you look on the, the, on the right side there, that's the results, right? So let's kind of look at it. On the bottom is time, compound interest. When we invest in good habits... What happens is, and we showed you with the penny, right? It happens very slowly, but then spikes and goes up real fast. We expect that if I do a little bit today, I should see 
the benefit. I do a little day, I see the benefit. But that's not the way it works. It's I do, I do, I do, I do, and then boom. And that's the nature of how our habits work. Let me give you an example. So let me just make sure we're on the same page yet. What temperature does ice, does water turn to ice? Does it freeze? 32 degrees. Very good. Had that brilliant audience. So imagine I have a block of ice. And the temperature in the room is zero. What's going to happen to the ice? It's going to stay frozen. Let's say it's five degrees. What's going to happen to the ice? It's frozen. But wait a minute. The temperature is going up, isn't it? Let's say I go up to 28 degrees. What's going to happen? Still frozen. What happens when I go to 33 degrees? It begins to melt. But it's only one degree, right? But what has happened is that change has begun to compound. And so from 33 on, that block of ice that stays solid, it begins to melt. And anything above 32, with a little bit of time, it'll totally melt. Is that true? And so our habits compound as well. You don't necessarily see it. And so you see that little, little, little uh, gap there. <laughs> it's the valley, of dis the valley of disappointment. Right? That's when we're doing the right things. Right? <laughs> but we're not seeing the results. It's like, but... That person at work who doesn't like me, I'm being nice to them. I'm doing the things that you told me to do. God, I'm, I'm, I'm praying and I'm, I'm, I'm fasting and my, my kid's still not saved. I'm, I'm trying to spend more time in my word, but I'm still distressed. I'm trying to be nice to my evil husband, <laughs> but he's still getting on my last nerve, right? And so we put forth effort, and we don't see immediate return, but we have to understand our habits compound as well. Let's go back to our new identity in Christ, Ephesians chapter 4. You were taught with regard to your former way of life, to put off your old self. You see, the effort that we make when we believe and understand who God says, we have to do something too, right? We want God to be magic. Like, Lord, help me lose weight. <laughs> right? <laughs> but my identity needs to change. So, with regard to your former life, put off your old self, which is being corrupted by his deceitful desires, and what? Be made new. In the attitude of your mind, be made new in your thinking. The attitude of your mind, be made new in your thoughts. And then put on your new self, created to be like God in righteousness and in holiness. So we have to do some things too. God does something. When we surrender our lives to him, he gives us the ability for our identity to completely change. He says, and then you have to do some stuff. So you have to put off your old self. He says, and they become like God in true righteousness, in right relationship with God, living life as he designed it, and in holiness, living set apart, living differently than we lived before. And so when our perception of ourself, our self-concept, our understanding of self changes, and we begin to live as who God says we are, we change from our identity out. And then we can experience the change that God wants for us. New identity. So now we read that. He gives us, he tells us what to do. So now we go from Ephesians, down to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 28. It says, from, from felony to philanthropy. He says, anyone who's been stealing, don't steal any longer. Stop stealing. That's a strategy. That's a plan, right? <laughs> change your habits. If you've been stealing, stop stealing. Your identity changed. Stop stealing. Watch this. And in, instead of, this is, the, this is the strategy. If you're stealing, you want to know, I'm giving you a, the three steps, the three keys, the five steps, the whatever, right? So stop stealing. And then he says, what? Get a job. <laughs> right? So the way that you get stuff, the old way used to be like, hey, you want to go get this? 
right? We're going to the mall. We're going to boost a little bit, wear a big jacket, whatever. We're going to do what we do. He says, if you want to switch that up, stop stealing, get a job, work, and why? So that you can take care of yourself, but also watch this. You can have something to share with other people. People who are in need. And so you go from a felon to a philanthropist. Your identity changes, and then what? You do different things. When our identity changes, we do different things. Watch this. So here's an example. Old identity, new goal. You want a cigarette, right? Here in Pittsburgh, we smoke a lot in this city. I remember when I, I was a, a kid and worked at the hospital. And this is so crazy, right? The hospital. People started smoking to get breaks. <laughs> Seriously. In the hospital, it's, it's crazy when you think about it. Everybody smoked. I worked at St. Francis. Maybe that's why they closed St. Francis. St. Francis Hospital, everybody smoked. The nurses are outside smoking. It's like, what in the world? And so for people who didn't smoke, you didn't get a cigarette break. I got friends who started smoking just so they could get a break. Right? I've seen people standing outside with their, dog, with their, their oxygen machines and carrying on. I'm like, you about to go boom, boom. What are you doing? Right? Unbelievable. So, but think about this. So, imagine you used to be a smoker or you're trying to stop smoking. Watch. So, somebody asks you, you outside with your friends on the break, and they ask, do you want a cigarette? And here's when your identity hasn't changed, but you're trying to change your behavior. You say, no thanks. Watch this. What am I doing? I'm trying to quit. So I'm trying to focus on the behavior. You see what I'm saying? I'm trying to quit. Now I'm still standing out there in the cold. That's the other thing I never understood. It's like three degrees and people stand outside. I'm like, wow, that thing made you go out. Go outside. <laughs> so you stand outside, you're smoking, and somebody offers you a and you made the resolution. You're like, I'm trying to quit. But the problem is you're focusing on the behavior, the desired outcome, and not on the identity. Now watch this. New identity, new goal. Do you want a cigarette? And what if the response was, no thanks, I'm not a smoker? You see the shift? Do You see what happened there? The person says, my identity has changed. Did you understand that? Who I see myself. When we understand who God has called us to be, when we understand who God says our identity is, those things that we wrestle with, we run, understand that the key is to change our identity and bring it into alignment with who God says we are and then allow him to change us through the Holy Spirit to become who he's created us to be. And you see, God sees us not as we are, but as he will shape us to be, how we can be. That's why, you see, God, Jesus never focused on people's behavior. Right? Because you can kind of mask your behavior, you can fight the behavior, but when you change who you are, when you change how you see yourself, when you change your identity, then everything changes. And so the challenge is for us to see ourselves as God sees us. And then we will act in alignment with what God says. Does that make sense? I'll give you another example. Hey, come over so we can Netflix and chill. Wink, wink. You know what next week is. <laughs> you know, oh, Christians be all deep like. <laughs> so, right, if your old identity, you like the person, whatever, right? Netflix and chill for those of us who are not quite aware of what I mean. What does that mean to Netflix and chill? Somebody tell me. To hook up. To hook up. What does that mean, Brother Nelson? You want to have sex. Thank you, Sister Teresa. Come over. We're going to turn on the movie. We're going to have some sex. Right? With or without Netflix. It's not really this. That's fine. Right? So, now, my old identity, I like the person. Um, well, maybe let's just watch the movie. Let's just do the Netflix part. 
Now, how does that work out generally? <laughs> right? This is a person with whom you've been intimate. You have this habit, right? Because what happens is the way behavior changes and, why, and the way it happens, right, there's a trigger. There's a craving, right? A desire. And then that tells us, particularly when it's a habit, Right? It's triggered something in us. We have a habit. This is how we deal with the habit. We do what we do. We find ourselves in this circle. And that's the way habits work. Right? And so to break the habit, we have to see ourselves differently. Imagine if it went like this. Hey, come over so we can Netflix and chill. Nah, I'm good. I'm not a fornicator. <laughs> wouldn't, that, wouldn't that shut it down? Wouldn't that shut That would kill all the mood, wouldn't it? Wouldn't they shut it down? <laughs> Y'all like, oh my, what church is this? I'm just, I'm trying to be a little bit real up in here. If you said, nah, bruh, I'm not a fornicator. Like, ooh, okay then, skip the movie. <laughs> you stay home, <laughs> right? If your image of yourself, y'all understood that example, didn't you? If your image of yourself, your self-concept or your identity changes, my wife identifies as a vegetarian. I identify as an omnivore. Omni, everything. Vore, eater. <laughs> I eat everything. But she is not tempted by meat because she identifies with, has the habit of, and even though for probably, I guess, 40 years of her life, she was a, a, a meat eater, at some point she decided Actually, as one of these, uh, one of our Daniel fast experiences, decided that she didn't no longer wanted to eat meat. She no longer identified as a meat eater. And so, even though I'm a fan of a lot of meat, and she'll even cook the meat. Now, I will say she doesn't tend to the meat like she used to. <laughs> when she was cooking the meat for her, it was something else. Now, you know, I better be cool. I ain't gonna get the meat. But see what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, well, catch yourself, sir. Right? But she's an excellent cook. Don't get it twisted. Right? But it's not a priority for her because she's not a meat eater. Right? So when her identity changes, meat doesn't tempt her. So we can go places where they got steaks and barbecue ribs and all of that stuff, and she's not the least bit bothered. Why? Because even though for 40 years... She had the habit of eating meat, and maybe multiple times a day. But when her identity changed, and let's be clear, our identity shapes our, our, our habits, our habits shape our identity, but at some point, our identity completely changes. And then we change. And that's what God wants to do for us when we become followers of Jesus Christ. It's not the behavior. You worry about the behavior. We do things and don't do things to impress other people. That's not the point. The question is, is our identity found in who Jesus Christ says we are? He says we're the children of God. That's who we are. We're fearfully and wonderfully made. That's who we are. And so the two questions that we want to answer, and as we go into 2020. For. What type of person does God want me to be? Aside from what kind of person do I want to be? What is the identity that God wants for me? Who does he want me to be? And the second is what habits will help me become that type of person? So those are the two questions that we want to wrestle with for 2024. And as we go into uh, our plan for 2024, and we'll email this uh, to you, and we, we have the reading plan in place already. We'll talk about um, very quickly about the, the Daniel plan, the fasting and so forth. So four pieces to our plan, fasting and prayer. Fasting is abstaining from food for a spiritual purpose. Abstaining from food for a spiritual purpose. And then prayer is simply asking for God's intervention into our situation, a conversation with God, asking him to intervene on our behalf. Daily time with God. And we'll send this out. And then also, if you go to bcpgh.info, 
I think it is how to hear God. I believe is what that on that page is there as well. How to hear God. So we'll read a scripture to get today. Every day, we're going to go through the Old Testament this year, right? So we're finishing the New Testament now. We're going to start back over in Genesis 1-1. The new series is going to focus on AI, authentic intelligence, in the beginning, God. And we're going to see, I love Genesis because it lays out the divine design for how the world was to operate. This was God's original plan. And so we're going to start in the book of Genesis and understand, God, what did you want? How did you intend the world to work? What did you want from us? Who do you say we are? Who do you say we were? Who are we supposed to be? And we'll get into all of that when we go into the book of Genesis. Daily time with God. So spending time with God, prioritizing that one-on-one time with God. And I can promise you, this is a habit that I've developed, and it has changed my life. Guaranteed. Promise. And then weekly time with our small group. We have here discipleship groups. We have small group Bible studies. If you're not ready for a discipleship group, I encourage you to at least get into the Bible study. We do sermon-based Bible studies, and so here's what we do on Sundays during the middle of the week when we have the Bible studies, and there are different times, different days. We'll dig more deeply. This is largely a monologue, but the dialogue is an opportunity to talk about it. I bought it. I didn't. I understood it. I didn't, right? And then, of course, we gather together on Sundays as a family, as a faith community. We hear the word. We worship God together. We celebrate him. We listen and we learn together. We hug each other. You know, some people... Sunday morning is the only physical touch they get from another human being. Sometimes we don't think about that, but that matters. Somebody saying that they love you. Somebody glad to see you. Just time to talk about what's going on in life. Time to smile, to laugh, enjoy life together. And so we gather on Sunday mornings as well. So real quick, fasting, fasting, the discipline of standing for food. The spiritual purpose is why to increase our intimacy with God. Don't focus on the food. The fast is not about what I can't have. Right? If you're fasting and it's focused on what I can't eat, you miss the point. And your mind will be constantly focused on what you can't have. Yeah, I mean, when you're fasting, everything, your sense, nose get real sensitive. You know what I'm saying? You, I can smell a pizza from three miles away. I'd be like, man, you smell that pizza? When you're fasting, everything looked good. The commercials look good, right? McDonald's, as nasty as McDonald's is, you know it is. And it, other than fries, you get triggered by a McDonald's commercial. You want some McDonald's so bad when you're fasting. So from January, we're going to start, and we'll do Monday through Friday, the whole month. If you want to, um, I don't know if you want to break the fast. I don't know if that's a good idea. But Monday through Friday, let's, let's agree to fast together. And if you need to do something on the weekend, you know, drink. Maybe a little um, water with lemon in it, Pepsi. Stop it. A little water with lemon in it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and a little sugar with that. Um, right? But I think it might be too much to just go straight. But the idea is let's, let's do this together. And what, are, what the fast will look like to you. I mean, we'll, we have some suggestions, but what's meaningful to you? Three types of fast. Total fast. That was going without food or water, and that happened uh, relatively seldom. For a specific period of time, usually three days. Jesus went 40 days. I'm not Jesus and you're not either. Don't do 40 days because it'll be like six and you'll be dead. Stop it. <laughs> right? Drink a bunch of water. The normal fast, abstaining for food for a set period of time. Again, usually that was two or three days, but usually drinking water. So biblically, it would have been drinking. And then a partial fast. And that's what we're talking about, what we call the Daniel fast or Daniel diet or whatever you want to call it. Going without certain foods for a limited schedule. Five reasons people fast in the Bible. First problem, uh oh. First problem for penance. Individual or groups sin against God. You would see groups of people, the entire city of Nineveh fasted. It said even the animals were in sackcloth and ashes, and God saved an entire city. And then for people, for individuals, groups, people who are seeking God's intervention. And then for plans, Jehoshaphat said, We don't know what we're going to do. They were being besieged by armies on both sides, on all sides. He says, I don't know what we're going to do. We're going to look to God, and we're going to see what he wants us to do. Number four, for problems, right? Specific issues would come up in people's lives, and they were fasting and seeking God's uh, intervention for the problems. And then finally, for power. God, I need your help to do something. And so people fasted for those five reasons in the Bible. 
How to fast, Matthew chapter 16, verse 16, 16, 18. Jesus says, when you fast, not if you fast. He presumed that his people, his children were going to fast. He said, when you fast, don't look somber as the hypocrites do. They disfigure their faces to show others they're fasting, right? People want to show out. You know I'm fasting. <laughs> you know, I don't brush my teeth. I'm not going to comb my hair. Got them dragons jumping out of your mouth because you want to impress people with your fast. He's like, don't do that. Because why? You've already received your reward. He says, but when you fast, put oil on your head, wash your face, so it will not be obvious to others that you're fasting, but only your father who is unseen, and your father who sees you was done in secret will reward you. And so he says, fast purposely. Fast for a reason. So if you're going to join us with the fast, have a reason for why you're fasting. Because it's not just about not eating. That's not it. The idea is to increase our intimacy with God, to spend additional time with God, Hearing from God, if there's something that you want from God, now is the opportunity. God, I want to change my identity in this area. Right? So if there's something that you know you need to fix, something that you know you want to improve, something that God has laid on your heart to be different about you and you want to change your identity, make that the purpose, the reason why you're fasting. Then he says to fake privately. He said, go into your closet. Right? You don't have to advertise why you're fasting. You don't have to be on Facebook. You know, y'all, I'm fasting because I want this new car. Right? Privately and then expectingly. He says you can expect to receive a reward. You can expect to receive. If you're praying in alignment with God's will and purpose and plan for your life, if you're aspiring for your identity to be aligned with his will, his plan and purpose for your life, expect that to happen. Is that okay? Abstain from other stuff. So fasting is by definition food. Then there's the idea of abstaining from stuff. So if, if you know that you need to abstain from something that's getting in the way, 2 Corinthians 7, 1 says, Therefore, since we have these promises, dear friend, let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates what? Body and spirit. Perfecting holiness out of reverence for God. So if there's something else, and the Spirit will speak to you, if you really are trying to pursue him, has the Spirit ever spoken to you and told you you need to stop? Amen. He says, don't do that. I tell the story often. I'm a, I'm a, I love comedy. I love watching comedy. And I used to be a big Saturday Night Live fan. But having, and this was back when I was in, in Michigan, when I was teaching Sunday school, the Spirit said to me, and this is nothing, if you want to watch Saturday Night Live, I'm not telling you it has nothing to do with you. I'm talking about me. He's like, I don't want you watching that and you go to bed on that and then you want to get up and teach my word in the morning. And this is back when, like, Eddie Murphy was on. Like, Saturday Night Live was funny. Right? But God said, that's not for you. And so we, we talked months ago about gray areas. There are those things that may not be an issue for some people, but they're a problem for you. And if you're sensitive to the Spirit, he will speak to you and will help you in that area. But then you have to be obedient. One of our, our young people said that, that, you know, she was praying and the Lord told her to get off TikTok. Okay. Right? You don't have to make people be your thing, their thing. Right? So that's why we fast in private. We seek God's direction and we allow Him to speak to us. Amen? And then finally, uh, and we'll send this out um, the reading plan. So again, excited to go through the Old Testament together. There are the videos on the Bible project as well as the reading every day. And so looking forward to God changing us. Changing our identity, changing us from the inside out so that we can experience the abundant life he has for us, be the people he's called us to be. Looking forward to 2024. Hope that you will join us. More details forthcoming. Amen. Amen. And so today, maybe somebody, for the first time, you kind of understood like, wow, God is for me. He wants what's best for me. God is not trying to keep me from anything. He's not trying to prevent me from experiencing and enjoying life. But God wants to change my identity. He wants me to see me as he sees me. And it's not how I am today, but it's how I can be. Jesus says he came that we could have abundant life, full life. Complete life, not a deprived life, 
Not a, I wish I had this. I wish I could do that. But God has a picture of a better future for all of us. Put differently, God has a vision for our lives. His vision is far better than ours. His plan is far more impactful than ours. And if we really want to experience life as God has designed it for us, we surrender our lives to him. We say, God, I, don't, I, can't, I, can't, I can't do it. I try. I think I know what's best for me, but it, it hasn't worked too well. And I may have money, I may have power, prestige, and position. But I think in everyone's life, there comes the point when you realize that that stuff is not enough. And each of us is made with a need for God. And so today I invite you to surrender your life to him. To ask him, God, I want you to change me, transform me. I give up. The Bible says in Romans chapter 10, it says, if we will confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord. And Lord means like he's the boss, he's the, he's the king, he calls the shots. And believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead. And I get it, that's a stretch, to believe that a human being died and then weren't dead again. But he says, if you believe that and you make him your king, your boss, your CEO, he says you'll be rescued. That's what the Bible, the word saved, that's what it means. You'll be rescued. You'll be rescued from the penalty of your sin. You'll be rescued from the life that you're living and then given a new life. The new life that we read about. He says, behold, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature. Our sins are forgiven. Our past is behind us. The scripture talks about he throws our sins into the sea of forgetfulness. And even though people may remember, God, the only one, the true judge, he's like, I forget. He's like, what did, what did they do again? I forget. And so today, if you want to make Christ your king, I invite you to come. Let's pray with you. Start fresh. He says you're a new creature. The Bible talks about being born again. You see, when you're born again, that means you're brand new. And so those core beliefs that you got when you were a child, he says we get to start over. We get to erase your hard drive, if you will. And then you can have a whole brand new set of core beliefs, kingdom core beliefs, based on what? The constitution of the kingdom of God. Based on what God says, not what mama said, not what your teacher said, not what your uncle, your daddy, your grandma, all those people who spoke negativity in your life. He says, no, I'm going to be a new, I'm brand new. And so I'm going to hear and receive what God says about me. Is there somebody today who you want to make that change? You want to start fresh? I invite you to come. I'd love to pray with you. the Spirit is speaking to you, I know it's tough. And the walk doesn't do anything for God, but it's you making the statement, I'm a different person. I'm choosing to change my identity. Give me three people just come up here to make it easy for somebody else. Even if you saved already, just come on up here to make it easy. <laughs> I don't need to know. If somebody wants to come and it's your time, 